Hi, think of me as John the Medpot combat engineer sapping the prohibitionists fortresses. This is the month's report on the court activities in federal court, federal court of appeal, and how we went from a 20 some people up to 148 statements of claim filed and asking for personal exemptions for medical use since none of us were satisfied by the Allard Conroy decision below. So real great action coming up as well. March 22nd, hopefully in Ottawa, everybody. Otherwise, conference calls by phone one at a time. Final point, I have a bad habit of saying March 22nd when I meet me in April the 22nd. Coming up. Hi, this is the Crown's documentation for my Federal Court of Appeal extension of time to file a notice of appeal like the six others who managed to file theirs. And I needed an extension of time because I'd been originally refused by the registry clerk who said you cannot appeal a direction. So the others got in, and this is my application for an extension of time to get in, too. So here is the Crown Attorney's version of things. All right, the written representations overview. The applicant seeks an extension of time to appeal a direction of the federal court staying his action. The applicant also seeks the consolidation of his appeal with several others and a constitutional exemption from the CDSA pending trial of this action. Two, the proposed appeal is without merit, of course. No appeal lies from a direction of the federal court. First time they say that. Even if a direction could be appealed, the March 7th direction was properly in issued in the interests of justice. The applicant has also failed to provide any explanation for his delay in pursuing an appeal. The request for an extension of time should therefore be dismissed. <clears throat> Now, they don't know when I went in on time the day before, the clerk said, sorry, you can't appeal. So I didn't, right? What could I do? <clears throat> well, I had to ask for an extension of time once the others got in. The request for an interim relief is similarly improper and abuse of this court's process. The applicant has provided no evidence that he will suffer irreparable harm in the absence of the requested exemption. This request, too, should be dismissed. Mind you, all the others were exemptees who can show irreparable harm. I'm healthy. Uh, the fact I can't prevent diseases from hitting me, that's not irreparable. Statement of facts. The applicant's claim. The applicant commenced this action on February 26th. The action seeks a declaration that the MMAR, which are scheduled for repeal on March 31st, and the MMPR, which came into force June 19th, are unconstitutional. In the alternative, the applicant seeks a permanent and a CDSA prohibitions with them. They forgot to mention. And in the alternative, the applicant seeks a permanent constitutional exemption from the marijuana provisions in the CDSA, or in the further alternative, damages for the loss of his marijuana plants and production site and stash. They forgot to say. Uh, in addition to the statement of claim, the applicant has filed a motion in the federal court for an interim constitutional exemption from the marijuana prohibitions pending trial of his action. The applicant does not claim to have a current medical diagnosis with which marijuana would exist. Well, a lot of things it prevents. Nor has he provided evidence of the support of a medical practitioner. Lots of legitimately sick people haven't either. Rather, he seeks marijuana to prevent illness it's good for before getting it. In materials recently filed in federal court, the applicant acknowledges possessing marijuana for this purpose, although not authorized by Health Canada to do so. Well, I might have said consuming, but not possessing. The Termel kit claims, seven, between February to, oh, the Termel kit claims. Between February 26 and this writing, some 128 statement of claims closely mirroring the applicants have been filed by plaintiffs at federal court registry offices in Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, Ontario, Quebec, and Saskatchewan. The Termel Kit claims. Of these plaintiffs, 30 have also filed motions needing books like this for requesting interim constitutional exemptions from the marijuana provisions in the CDSA pending trial of their actions. As at March 7th, 
The Facebook page, Big Rainmaker, advised that hundreds across Canada are filing with local registry office, Google to find, to get notice for millions in damages. 10. This Facebook page includes a link to the website, johntermel.com slash kits, where are links to templates, statements of claim, motion materials, and filing instructions, virtually identical to those described above, are available under the heading, Termel's Grow Up Exemption Kits, and or legal defense kits. Hey, you can fight your charges with kits too. Allard versus Her Majesty the Queen, T2030-13. A proceeding seeking relief similar to that sought by the applicant, Allard, is also currently being litigated in federal court. The plaintiffs in Allard initially brought a class action to challenge the constitutionality of the MMPR on November 29th. On December the 10th, the class action was discontinued, good news, and replaced by a new claim on behalf of the individually named plaintiffs. Only four of them rule. Like the applicant, the at-large plaintiffs seek a declaration that the MMPR infringed Section 7 of the Charter of Rights by unreasonably restrict I said fraudulently and genocidally, but unreasonably, restricting access to the marijuana for medical purposes. Like the applicant, the Allard plaintiffs specifically allege that the MMPR restrict access by failing to provide for personal production of marijuana for medical purposes, by prohibiting outdoor and by limiting production to dried marijuana, and by limiting the amount of marijuana that an individual user may store to a 150 grams. Well, it's not store. Storage is the normal amount. It's uh, how you can carry and possess. 14. Like the applicant, the Allard plaintiffs also brought a motion for interlocutory relief pending trial. The Allard motion. So we all got a right to do that too. Unlike the applicant, the Allard plaintiffs are currently authorized by Health Canada to possess marijuana for medical purposes. Lots of our guys are too. Lawrence Cherniak with a 200 gram per day prescription should have been in there before the judge said everybody can only have 150 a month. Or per shot, per dose, per delivery. Unlike the applicant, they're authorized. Okay, in support of their motion, the Allard plaintiffs and Crown filed several affidavits, including affidavits from each plaintiff concerning their medical diagnoses and experience obtaining and using marijuana for medical purposes, just like all of our gold stars have done. The evidence also included extensive affidavits from some senior Health Canada officials. Well, we got them online on record in that case there. They can come and rely again, but they're dead either way. From the Health Canada officials and several from experts and disciplines including psychology, drug law and policy, law enforcement, and health economics. <laughs> Who cares? Experts. Oh, the federal court stays the related claims. Now gets the fun part. And don't forget, here we are, we're all asking to have our motions heard at general sittings in Halifax and um, Montreal and Toronto on, no, Montreal, Toronto on Tuesdays, and Halifax, Ottawa, Vancouver on the Wednesday, so that everybody gets their shot at a live hearing, and only one or two people need to speak. So, but, the Crown don't like that. So, on March 7th, counsel to Her Majesty the Queen in right of Canada in Raymond Termel and Anthony Van Edig, uh, who have filed one of the Termel kits. The letter to the administrator noted deficiencies in the motion record by the plaintiff in support of the motion for interim relief and expressed concern with the plaintiff's request that his motion be heard during the federal court's general sittings. So, if you look at these file reports from the internet, which you can look at everybody's uh, file and their documentation, only in Ray Termel's do you find where you have the letter from defendant dated April 7th advising that this matter should not be scheduled for hearing until the motion in Allard T203013 is adjudicated. Now, 
The March 7th letter also called the court administrator's attention to the Allard action and pending motion. In light of these concerns and the similar issues raised in Allard, yeah, four of our 20, the letter requested that the plaintiff's motion not be scheduled until the Allard motion was adjudicated. So as the March 7th letter was not a motion, because you have to make an official motion and give proper service to the other guy or other formal step, just a backroom letter to the court administrator to give the judge a nudge. There was no requirement that it be served in accordance with the rules. However, a copy was sent to the plaintiff by mail that arrived three days after it was over. That's how the Attorney General of Canada plays. Fair. Also, on March 7, Chief Justice Crampton of the Federal Court issued a direction staying 25 Termel kits. Wow, what a surprise! Including the applicants and all other filings and motions seeking the same or similar relief, pending the determination of Allard motion. Another surprise! The March 7 direction noted that until further notice from the court, no further steps are to be taken on these matters, and if the stay mentioned above is lifted, any motions seeking similar relief shall be scheduled as special sittings. The March 7 direction further noted that the court had received numerous filings seeking similar relief to that sought by the applicant, and that the court had already scheduled a hearing for March 18th on the Allard motion, which raised many of the very same issues. A. Four out of 20 ain't many. It's few. And if they use that word again, I'm going to challenge them officially. If you're watching, Mr. Crown Attorney, don't say many of the very same issues again. Four out of 20 ain't many. 23. On March 10th, the judge issued a correction. He forgot one word in the thing. So the March 7th letter from Crown Counsel did not request that the Termel kit actions be stayed. Rather, the stay appears to have been issued by the federal court of its own volition, pursuant to either the discretion conferred under this section and the court's inherent general destruction to control its own process. That's an example of the word disingenuousness. Gee, look, they stayed everybody. Couldn't have been us. Couldn't have been because we asked for it, because we didn't ask for it officially. We didn't even serve them properly. That's how unofficially we didn't ask. On March 10th, the applicant faxed a letter to the attorney to the Ottawa Registry of the Federal Court. It noted that Termel Kit claims raised additional issues. Hey, five times more than those raised in Allard and requested an urgent hearing of the related motions for interim constitutional exemptions. On March 17, Justice Barnes of the Federal Court issued an oral direction. The direction noted the applicant's March 10th letter, but reaffirmed that no further action is to be taken until after the Allard matter, note the word matter, not motion, like Justice uh, Stay said. So, as a result, this direction has not been appealed. Jeez, I thought you said we couldn't appeal direction. <laughs> e, adjudication of the Allard motion, 27. The federal court ruled on the Allard plaintiff's motion. So, Justice Manson granted in part the Al Allard plaintiff's request for interim relief from the effects and repeal of the MMAR. As of this writing, there have been no further directions from the federal court with respect to the March 7th direction. The March 7th direction therefore remains in place. One. <laughs> the judge said it's in place until the motion is heard. The motion's been heard and the crown's now saying it's still in place. <laughs> if anyone, lawyers, they'll say anything hoping the judges are stupid enough to buy it. Anyway, notices of appeal. In addition to the present motion, the plaintiffs in six of the Termel kits have successfully filed notices of appeal. And that is Ray, Aniette, Bella, Lawrence, Terry, and Sam. 
with another six on time uh, to appeal the March 7th direction, as well as motions for consolidation of the repeals with that of the applicant, me, the guy who needs the extension of time. Points in issue. The motion raises the following issues. Has the applicant met the test for an extension of time to appeal the March 7th direction staying his action? If A is answered in the affirmative, should the applicant's appeal be consolidated with the other appeal? And C, should the applicant have an interim constitutional exemption from the CDSA pending trial? 31. The respondent submits that A and C, uh, extension of time and exemption, should be answered in the negative. However, if A, they say, yeah, you can get an extension of time to appeal to, the respondent submits that B should be in the affirmative. Consolidate us. One, okay, smart move. Submissions. The applicant does not meet the test for an extension of time. I was late. Uh, 32, paragraph, gone. 33, the test for granting an extension of time to appeal is well established. The party seeking the extension must establish, one, a continuing intention to pursue the appeal. A, one day late. Two, that the proposed appeal has some merit. Everybody else's does. Three, that the respondent will not be prejudiced by delay. One day delay, no prejudice. And four, that a reasonable explanation for the delay exists. A, they improperly refused it when I tried to file it on time. One, no reasonable explanation for the applicant's delay. The applicant has provided no explanation for his delay. I didn't want to embarrass the registry, okay? In seeking to file a notice of appeal, he asserts badly that he submitted his notice of appeal in time, but was unable to get the registry to accept it. However, the applicant provides no details, nor any explanation as to why others met the deadline and got in, but he could not. Well, the others didn't have the registry say no. <laughs> the failure to provide any explanation for his delay is alone sufficient to dispose of the applicant's extension for re requested. The proposed appeal lacks merit. There's no appeal from a direction. Keep repeating it. I say there is. Oh, the story is this. I filed my notice of appeal against the direction, and the lady said, you can't do that. So, I went back and I looked at the rules. One, The rules say that an, within an order, a judge may issue directions. Well, you can't issue a direction if it's not within an order. So a direction's got to be an order. So I actually took that part and I stuck it in raised notice of appeal that said, since this is an, you know, a direction from a judge within an order, it's got to be an order and I'm appealing. And so those six got in. And mine that didn't point out, hey, your own rules say that's wrong to the lady who told me I couldn't. Well, they got in. Now I went back the next day with mine, got in too. Or got it, my extension of time applied for in anyway. So, so you can't appeal. So the applicant seeks to appeal a direction of the federal court. This court, the Court of Appeal, has consistently held no appeal lies from a direction, including a direction staying one proceeding pending the outcome of another. And yet, six of ours got in. <laughs> ah, the stay was properly issued. Oh yeah, he's going to say the judge had good reason. In any event, even if a direction could be appealed, the March 7 direction was properly issued, and any appeal from it is destined to fail. The federal court may, in its discretion, stay proceedings on the ground that the same claim is being pursued in another court, or where, for any other reason, it is in the interest of justice that the proceedings be stayed. Well, that's the catch-all, right? We can get them with the catch-all, so they're caught. This court considered the test applicable to stays pending another proceeding in Milan Pharmaceuticals, Inc. The court held that a party seeking a stay in these circumstances need not satisfy the exacting four-part test set out in R.G. McDonald. Rather, the question for the court is whether in all circumstances interest of justice support delaying the matter. Yeah, 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 the general catch-all. In the circumstances of this case, the interests of justice clearly favored a stay of the applicant's action pending adjudication of the Allard motion. Of course, if I'd been there pointing out the 150 gram limit was based on a statistical fraud and Lawrence was there with his 200 gram limit, yeah, government would have been at a disadvantage. 
The Supreme Court of Canada has emphasized that charter litigation should not be conducted in a factual vacuum in Allard. The plaintiff's injunction motion alone involved several volumes of affidavit evidence from the plaintiffs. Don't forget, they're trying to prove something with evidence, and I get to prove it with math, so we don't need all that evidence. And experts in several disciplines. It is reasonable to assume that Mr. Kamal's claim, which by his own account raises several more issues than Allard, several times more issues than Allard, would require as much, if not more, evidence. Well, actually, mine are so big and clear cut, I just can't imagine. Look at mine, sh look at no din. That hurts people more than it helps. Can you really explain to me how not having financial support because there's no din helps poor people more than it hurts? So I can do that for every one of the bad ones. Really, they're not going to have much to answer, will they? They can argue with Conroy's cosmetics, but not my uh, fatal to the heart shots. So, would require much more evidence. You don't have any evidence to explain how it helps more than it hurts to my expert testimony that it hurts more than it helps. Taken together, the constitutional issues and sheer number of similar claims are likely to consume considerable judicial resources, and the resources of all parties involved in these circumstances it was entirely reasonable for the court to stay the Termelkit claims pending a decision in another proceeding, should have said an inferior proceeding, which had the potential to significantly narrow the issues for determination of the Jamal Kid claims. Four out of 20 ain't significantly, is it? There are also very real potentials for inconsistent judgments. Right, Manson handed down 150 because he didn't find out about Lawrence's 200. You're damn right there'd be inconsistent judgments. Which one's right? Were the applicant's claim and the other Turmel claims allowed to proceed in parallel with the Allard one? Gotta settle the Allard one so we can win our 150 before anybody finds out about the fraud in Lawrence's 200, right? The applicant suggests that the March 7th direction staying his action has caused him prejudice. Well, I was ready to wait till after the 18th as long as it was before the 31st D-Day, right? I even wrote them that and that it precluded his bringing a motion in federal court for interim relief pending trial. However, the stay is not the only bar to the applicant's motion. Rule 298, and when it's urgent enough, all rules are dispensable, of the federal court rules requires motions in the simple flawed action to be brought at a pre-trial conference. Oh, it got a technicality on an urgent issue. After pleadings have closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we come. Hey, they got to give everybody their statement of defense within 30 days. 44 with the stay. That means it's going to be before March 22nd where everybody gets their big books. <laughs> A lot of paperwork, right? So, as, as pleadings have not yet closed. That's right. You ain't delivered their, their big books yet. The applicant is unable to bring his motion in federal court regardless of the stay. But he is because of the urgency. In these circumstances, another claim with the potential to significantly narrow the issues in the applicant's case, the potential for inconsistent judgments, and the absence of any prejudice to the applicant. Well, how about the other guys with exemptions got to live with 150 now? What about Lawrence? And it was entirely in keeping with the interests of justice to place the applicants, and he means all of us, on hold, pending the Allard injunction motion. And the judge put Lawrence on hold. The court's decision to stay the applicant's action was therefore properly exercised, and the applicant's appeal should have proceed is destined to fail. An extension of time to file the applicant's appeal would therefore serve no purpose. Alternately, the related appeal should be consolidated. Any alternative if the applicant is granted an extension of time to file his appeal, and Mike Spot is would, and Gerard Fox too. The respondent agrees. How come they didn't get one of these books? Filed same day as me. Right? With the other appeals from the March 7 direction, that's the big six who got in, as the appeals appear to raise similar issues. And Stephen Burroughs, they never let him in to be dismissed by three judges. They just held off until the three judges dismissed the big six, and they dismissed Burroughs with only one. Too bad. As the appeals appear to raise similar issues, 
and the consolidation would not result in any prejudice, all of whom have also requested consolidation. Yeah, we requested it once. You ain't getting it again. Now we're all going in individually unless you ask to get us all in together. Ha! <laughs> the request for interim relief is improper. The applicant's request for an interim constitutional exemption from the marijuana positions of the CDSA is improper and unsupported by the evidence. What? That it's good for a lot of things and it's probably preventing them too? The applicant's already filed a motion in the federal court seeking an interim constitutional exemption from CDSA prohibitions on the possession, production, trafficking of marijuana. Although that court has not yet ruled on the issue, hey, they stayed it! The applicant now seeks the same relief from this court, right to a court where it ain't stayed. In essence, the applicant asks this court to act as a court of first instance to make findings of fact. Now we just want some protection while we finally get to the findings of fact below. That is not this court's role and would deny this court the benefit of the reasoning and analysis of the court below, which hasn't made any. The applicant's request is similar to that of an appellant who raises a charter argument for the first time on appeal. Well, if you ain't had the chance below, where else? But it's not actually a constitutional argument. What it is, it's saying, let me make it and give me some protection while I do. The court medical arguments, not constitutional. The court has declined to entertain an appellant's charter arguments. It is an abusive process to request relief in one court where the same request has been made but not yet adjudicated. No, 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 no. Stayed. Difference between not yet adjudicated. Obviously, if the judge is thinking about it and it's on tap, we wouldn't have appealed, right? Stayed. Not adjudicated. <laughs> Lawyers. Oh, such requests should be struck and not entertained on the merits. Moreover, although the applicant appears to challenge the constitutional validity, applicability, and operability of an act of parliament, albeit only on an interim basis. The applicant has not served a notice of constitutional question on the Attorney General and does not appear to have served one either on the Attorney Generals of each province. Accordingly, constitutional relief is not available at this time. Well, we're certainly going to serve them 30 days before our actions are heard. Now we just want protection while we wait. So maybe they want, maybe we should all do that too. Come on now. Ever, hey, why not? They suggested it. We can now start faxing it to 15 different people. They want notice? We'll give them notice. Yeah. The applicant has not established <laughs> irreparable harm. Okay, the applicant seeks an interim constitutional exemption from the CDSA prohibitions on possession, production, trafficking. In the recent Allard motion, Manson rejected a vir virtually identical request noting that the proposed exemption was without limitation and inconsistent with the purposes of the MMAR, which prescribed the quantities and circumstances in which a medically approved patient may possess and grow marijuana. Such a sweeping exemption is similarly inappropriate here, where we asked for personal medical use. Oh, he forgot to mention that limit we asked for. And he points out that Conroy got rejected because he didn't say personal medical use and that we should be rejected as just as inappropriate. See, Conroy wants his people to be able to sell the kids in the streets. <laughs> I get my point. And the judge said, no way. But I put in personal medical use. And the Crown's saying, well, because that's inappropriate, personal medical use is too. <laughs> oh, what fun. Justice Manson opted instead for partial exemption from the effects of the MMAR repeal. He did so on the basis that the repeal of the MMAR would cause Allard plaintiffs irreparable harm as they would be unable to afford marijuana for medical purposes. And every other exemptee who got cut off and lost their grows. Gee, better put in a claim for cash if they made a mistake. And this inability will likely affect either their health, endanger their liberty, or severely impoverish them. The court rejected as too speculative. However, the Allard plaintiff's request for mineral relief from the 150 gram limit on possession. So whatever junk evidence John Conroy low tech argued against the 150, it was too speculative, couldn't be pinned down. But if I'd been there, 
Had it been able to show that within how many standard deviations the number was a fraud. And then Lawrence could have stood there and said, Your Honor, how are you going to deliver me my 200 a day in only 20 mailing days? And I can't even collect two packages. <laughs> two packages in a day. So anyway, it's... Uh, anyway. Too speculative, John Conroy's request. Without limit. Or the 150. Okay, unlike the allied plaintiffs, yes, the applicant's not authorized to possess and produce marijuana and does not suggest that the repeal of the MMAR will in any way affect his health or liberty, but rather he seeks to use marijuana as a prophylactic against illnesses that he may develop in the future. Why can't he use the word prevention like I do? Prophylactic. That's like a great big shell blocking out the bad stuff. Prevention, well, that's an interior force fighting off the bad stuff. It ain't prophylactic at all, is prevention. Gee, they can't use the word prevention and they've come up with prophylactic. In Hitzig and Her Majesty the Queen, the Ontario Court of Appeal rejected a similar argument by the applicant noting there was no medical evidence presented that the smoking of marijuana by healthy individuals has any prophylactic effect whatsoever. And remember, the case was originally called Parker Hitzig, well, actually, Parker Termelin Hitzig, and then the judges switched the name at the last minute, Hitzig Parker Termel, to give Hitzig the credit. So, yeah, I was connected with the Hitzig case. That's why they refer to Hitzig when talking about applicant me. I was an appellant. Hitzig was a cross appellant. When was the last time you heard a case named after the cross appellant? As the applicant appears to have no present medical need, well, prevention's a medical need for marijuana, there can be no irreparable harm in refusing to request for interim relief pending trial of the action. And if I have an epileptic fit and die tomorrow, someone go get him. The absence of irreparable harm alone is sufficient to dispose of this request. Cost submissions. They want money. In the event this motion is denied, costs should be awarded against the applicant. The authorities cited by the respondent are clear and on point. The applicant cannot appeal the direction of the federal court. Now, how many times has he said that? Three, four? And cannot seek relief from an appellate court without first seeking that relief from the trial court. Well, we did, and it was stayed. The applicant nevertheless seeks to do so. That's right, it was stayed. Moreover, the applicant manifestly cannot meet the requirements for a constitutional exemption from the CDSA. Why? Prevention doesn't count? Despite this, he brings this motion and is engaged in an active campaign to encourage others to do so, especially those who are sick. This is an, in, this is an appropriate case for an award of costs. A supporting bill of costs is hereto attached for $700. Dated March 28, 2014. Neat. Okay, so let's go on what happened now. Now remember, March the 5th, order to put me down for special hearing. March 7th, letter of the Crown Attorney saying, don't put it down for special hearing and I'd like you to state, please. But unofficially, I'm not going to file a motion and do due service. Backroom uh, communication should be enough. And then later in the day, the issue of the 25 different people being stayed pending Allard, which I could live with until Allard the 18th. That gave me almost two weeks to be heard too. Could they stall us that long, people with big diseases? And then finally on the 17th, uh, no further action is taken until Allard, even though I just want to book a date before the 31st. And then the Court of Appeals said, Oh, this one here is my application for an extension of time should be done in writing and dealt with in writing. Meanwhile, Justice Dawson at the Court of Appeal on the 20th issued this direction ordering that the six appeals of the direction of the federal court be accepted. Gee, the Crown said four or five times that you're not allowed to appeal a direction. And yet six got in. Okay, so the judge wasn't fooled by the number of times that the Crown Attorney said, you cannot appeal a direction. Here's why. They referred to 
the cases they cited, Aga Khan versus Tajdin, and Peak Innovations versus Simpson Strong. Okay, so when you go look at those two cases, here's what they say. When a prothonotary, that's like a super clerk, but not a judge, who's allowed to act judgy once in a while, issues a direction. It cannot be appealed to a judge of the court. Now, we're not asking to appeal a direction from a prothonotary to a judge. We're asking to appeal a direction from a judge to three judges. So that's not really right on, is it? To say that he can't appeal a judge to three judges because he can't appeal a prothonotary to one judge. Oh, what's their other case? Peak innovations. And what's that argument? Gee, you cannot appeal the direction of a prothonotary to a judge. So the Crown says, because you can't appeal a prothonotary to a judge, Termel can't appeal a judge to three judges. And yet, the law says that it, a direction is issued within an order by a judge. It's an order, and six got in, and the Crown was wrong every time. You know, so was the registry. I should write to the Chief Justice, and I should ask him to instruct the Attorney General that directions from judges are appealable. They're not like directions from prothonotaries. What do you think? You think the Chief Justice should instruct the registry clerks and the Attorney General on how this really works? Oh, my letter asking for the 26th in the Court of Appeal for a motion. In case we can get it in Ottawa. No answer. That was weird. And on the 25th, again, I ask now for the 31st. Okay, this is the date we want. Last day before, you know, D-Day, please. I'm coming in to file. And then when I do get my information, my motion ready to go, I get a letter. I try to file my motion, and I get refused. I let them know I'm going to come in, and they send me an email saying, Oh, your motions below are still stayed. Ah, really? Tell me so. So anyway, that's when I took the motion and I added the bit about it can't be stayed because the motion's dead. It used the word motion. And I stuck it in Ray's motion. And he went back the next day and he showed the clerk, look, the judge's March 7th decision said until the motion and the motion is heard, so take it in and send it to a judge. And sure enough, they got in. <laughs> so, so, anyway. Uh, and anything else now? Oh, here's the one. I added a part to the thing that said, where it usually says, take notice, a motion will be heard at the court. And I added and raised things. Now that the March 7th direction of Chief Justice Crampton ordering my motion stayed, pending the determination of the plaintiff's motion, not matter, in T203013 has ended with the March 21st determination of the motion in 203013. And they all got in. <laughs> so now we're coming up now to 28th. And all of a sudden, we got our first. And I went in the next day and I filed mine as well, my motion. Got it sent up for direction. Then on the 31st, now, I'm setting up different kits for people to file this because, you know, I mean, uh, they're still getting to go into the Court of Appeal. And right away, as long as this stays alive, and we don't know if it is or not. But anyway, we've managed to get in at the bottom saying it's over. And then suddenly, March 31st, I get an order from Justice Crampton directing that all of our 124 names on this list are now stayed pending whenever a case management judge he just appointed Justice Phelan instructs us we can go. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that's a state. I mean, wow. That lets everybody right away file. So that was March 31st. We're going to Ottawa for April the 1st. So I immediately now change the notices of appeal from against the March 7th stay that I'm now saying is now over 
to the March 31st day that's brand new, okay? And we're going to April 1st, and we're going to sign up a whole bunch of people to a notice of appeal of the brand new stay. Now, what's neat is I wanted to see if I could find someone who could walk in, file a notice of appeal, and then say, sorry, you can't file a motion. I mean, uh, file a statement of claim, and then say, sorry, you can't file a motion because it's now stayed, and then boom, file a notice of appeal right there. And then go file your motion to be heard by a judge there. And we got two of those, okay? Uh, Sharon Meisner and Dale Connors signed up for their statement of claims at one, and as soon as they said your thing is stayed, they filed their notices of appeal, and they're in the higher level. <laughs> Nine that day. So, on April the 1st, now we get a decision from Chief Justice Blair of the Federal Court of Appeal. And basically he rules the stay died after the motion was over. Therefore, these appeals are now mooted. With me, he said the stay died after the motion and therefore you don't need an extension of time to appeal. That's dismissed too. Oh, number two. And finally, as for the 700 bucks in costs, Justice Blair made no such order. So, thank you very much, and I hope Health Canada gets the message. And to another five people I didn't know. So we had 15 people who filed notices of appeal against the March 7th, and we all got mooted. But, here's the point. As he issues that order, and it's like nine that I know of, but it's actually 15 off his desk. Okay. Boom! Nine new ones show up on his desk the very same day, April Fool, of this new stay, staying everybody. Now, you'll remember I said I felt a nibble. They were halfway in my trap. Here's why. The March 7th stay said, I stay these 25 and all future ones. And the March 31st one said, I stay these 124. And he didn't mention all future ones. So I didn't know if they would be getting an automatic stay. So it was kind of neat when uh, the first, uh, I think Dale went in there and he asked, okay, I want to file my statement of claim. Uh, can I do a motion? No, I stayed. Okay, file your notice of appeal right away. New ones too. Even if he forgot to mention it in his order. They're staying them anyway. So it's ticket into the Court of Appeal. And that's how, it's like a guy with a big barricade and he throws down his biggest bricks first. Well, what that means is that you can get on top of them to go higher. <laughs> and now everybody, the 125 for sure, and every newbie can now scoot right over the federal court, judges who ain't going to give us our hearing, straight to a federal Court of Appeal demanding urgent one judge hearing. And we pulled it off. So, now, Jesus, I was in Ottawa that day with Ray and Ariette and Bella and Lawrence and Terry and Sam. And we all forgot to file our notices of appeal against the new March 31st thing. And the next day, I figure, oh, they're in. Well, I'm, you know, I've got a lot of time now, you know. I mean, to, and then the next day, Justice Phelan, the case management judges, lifts all the stays, and now we can't appeal no more. So, we, the original seven, we don't get a chance to join the other nine who did get in on the March 31st appeal gold stars against the stay because we moved too slowly. So now everybody's back in below. Now, at the April 1st demonstration, You'll note if you look at the media, you didn't see me there. <laughs> but I had the biggest sign, and I'm going to show it to you right now. This is my, oh, let me save my documents here. That is my double placard, which I wave around like a flag with little extra papers on the extensions. But this one here says, because I'm gonna, I was going to go lay an information against Health Canada for the fraud and the genocide that morning, April 1st, but too much was happening. I never got away, and I still haven't pulled that trigger yet, but it'll happen before March 22nd. But RCMP, help, under-medicated by factor of nine. Health Canada's 150-gram patient limit is based on perjured testimony, citing false surveys, 
that inflict on the group conditions of life calculated eight ninths to bring about its physical destruction in violation of Criminal Code Section 318.2. Go look it up. Now, the other one said, Health Canada's close order bluffed you out of renewing? And let's face it, January, February, March, who's going to renew in those months when they ain't got enough time for another cycle? So that's like a quarter of the year, which is a quarter of renewing license, like a quarter of 25,000 people. That's like 6,000 people may have been bluffed out of renewing before they found out that, hey, their grow-ups have been grandfathered, but Conroy forgot to get their ATPs grandfathered. So, how can I buffed you out? Conroy grandfathered your grow permit, but forgot your possessed permit? Ask a judge for interim exemption for personal medical use and compensation. Two bucks using johnturmel.com slash kits. And of course, on the very end there, it had the 125, uh, the big stay order that we'd all been stayed the day before. So, none of the news, noses for news were interested in the 125 stays at the federal court and the new nine new appeals going in that day. Now, I turn it around and show you the other side. So, this is a comparison of, sorry, small text, I'll read it, of Termel's Gold Star Team for NMAR, MMPR repeal, Conroy's coalition against MMAR, MMPR repeal. Remember, MMAR they want to keep alive and MMPR they want to fix. Flawed MMAR, MMPR means no CDSA prohibitions. Fixed MMAR, MMPR means valid CDSA prohibitions. Why does Conroy want it fixed? Termel wants it condemned. Now I got a list. You got the MMAR and MMPR torts present in both regimes, and you got the Termel column and the Conroy column. So you got X's in every column for me. One, require recalcitrant doctor. Big flaw in both regimes. Two, not provide DIN. Hurts more than it helps. Three, require annual renewals for permanent diseases that simply clog up doctors' offices for no useful purpose. Four, require unused cannabis to be destroyed. Before you can collect next month's supply, you gotta destroy last month's overage, and if you run short, tough. Five, refusal of cancellation for non-medical reasons. And they can do that, okay? They can refuse you for non-medical reasons. They did that to Nova Scotia, a whole bunch of people with the cameraman's case. All right. Oh, he was in the wrong province when he signed the forms. He should have stayed in his office in Ontario. Then everything would have been okay. Done it by Skype, like the BC doctors. But he did a house call. Guilty. Cancel everybody. It's in the statement of claim. Uh, Health Canada feedback on doctors on dosages. They used to haul doctors and harass them about five grams per day. Of course, now they want it. Not provide instantaneous online processing. You can get your driver's license, your hunter's license, your health license done instantaneously. Only this thing takes snail mail by priority coast. Post. Not have resources to handle demand. Well, they broke down the MMAR in 2010, I think, when they went from 5,000 extra applications and they were late with everybody's renewals and everybody had to destroy their pot. They were all guilty of not destroying their pot due to Health Canada renewals and their destruct order. Not have resources. Prohibit non-dried forms of marijuana then in the MMAR. Oh, and of course, John Conroy mentions that in the MMPR. And not exempt from CDSA 5. People aren't allowed to traffic their seeds and their strains and sample new brands. That's trafficking, and that needs protection. Okay, the other one over here, only the MMPR, 11. The ATP you can only use solely as a medical document, okay? And that's it. It's dead after that, um, though proof of establishes medical need. So, 12, the licensed producer can cancel you for a business reason. Isn't that dirty? Oh, he can pay more and I'm short on stock. Sorry, you're canceled. Can I have my license, my prescription back? Sorry. Next one says, 
prohibit return of medical document. Sorry, can't give you any and you can't get your prescription back. Go start over. John Conroy didn't notice this stuff. Uh, prohibit production in a dwelling. Oh, he noticed that one. Prohibit outdoor production. Oh, he noticed that one. Uh, not protect rights to brand genetics. That's right. You turn it over to the LP. What can he do with it? Not remove financial barriers. Yeah, Canada Health Act says there should be none. And by not giving you a DIN, they haven't done that, right? No registry for police identification. And that's true, too. You know, you just got these little bottles with these tags. And what if a guy doesn't believe it? You know, there should be some kind of a registry that only the cops can take a look at to make sure you're legit. I don't mind that. But we're trying to get rid of the law so that's not needed, right? <laughs> but it's a flaw. And puts people under stress again. So, uh, not enough licensed producers to supply demand. And we got that evidence in the Allard case. 1,500 keys in reserve, 15,000 keys monthly demand dosage prescribed. Require a specialist consultation is the MMAR flaw, which the MMAPR doesn't even need anymore. So, couldn't have been needed in the MMAR either, and it impeded a lot of access. No land commission said so. Um, conventional treatment's inappropriate. The specialist has got to decide that all conventional treatments are inappropriate and state that, okay, before you can try the herb. All chemicals got to be considered first. Prohibit more than two licensed growers per garden. I mean, uh, um, patients per grower. Well, that's the old Hitzig flaw and the Svetkopoulos flaw that condemned the law last time. And the next one, prohibit more than four licenses per grower. What they did was, it used to be one patient per grower. They lost Hitzig, unconstitutional, laws dead for two years. Then they lost Svetkopoulos, unconstitutional, laws been dead for two years, but they didn't drop any charges that time. And then finally they went, okay, one's unconstitutional, we'll make it two. And then in Hitzig, three growers per spot, unconstitutional, two years dead. They put it back. Seven years later, Barron strikes the four, the three down, unconstitutional. They go, okay, we'll make it four. They're laughing at the courts. Anyway, same thing with the 150. They can say, okay, we cave, 151. <laughs> no kidding. They did it the other two times. Okay, finally, the number of plants as a limiting parameter is stupid. Sick people need to grow little ones so they can move their pots around. And limiting the number of plants makes it big ones. It also forces you to work all year when you could be doing it in the winter when you don't need air conditioning expenses, right? Why can't I plant twice as many in one season and none in the other? And finally, they won't even allow gardening help in the MMAR for sick people. If you are your own PUPL, you're not allowed to have anybody to help you. Isn't that thoughtful of Health Canada? And now they got to argue that that helped more than it hurt for every one of these torts I've raised. Now, I want to point out that every single one that Cosmetic Conroy raised Health Canada can give up on and then be stuck with stamp of approval of John Conroy working regime, the court working regime with all the other 16 flaws we got to live with. And all they got to do is give up on the 150, 151, or maybe 160 and give up on the outside. Sure, let the LPs grow outside, even indoors in your own home if you got big enough million dollar security. And finally, sure, use your hash oil. We already lost in BC already. Four easy gives by Health Canada, and they're left with what's called by John Conroy with a working regime to keep the CDSA prohibitions alive, while the 16 big ones sit unlooked at by John Conroy. All right? So, now, the most interesting part in all this now that Justice Phelan has lifted our motions, is we're all applying for April the 22nd in Ottawa, a live hearing, hopefully video televised so people out of town can watch it. And hopefully they'll have to open up the Supreme Court of Canada building for a building big enough to accommodate us all because we're all going to be on ta in town for April the 20th. So we're going to stick around. We want to go into the federal court on April the 22nd. 
and we all want to have our emotions determined and heard. Not too many people need to speak if I get to go first. But here's my point. Now, what did Health Canada win with the LR decision? They got their cherished 150 gram limit imposed. They've been wanting that for a decade. And my affidavit proves that the actual average, in their average of one to three, must be two. And that the actual average cited in the judge's decision is 18. Which actually shows that the amount that the limit was based on was a function of two, nine times under the 18 it should have been. Get it? So, that's one. Most important, though, is the extension of time. That now they don't have to have licensed producers ready to deliver. And they didn't have any enough anyway. So, the evidence in Allard shows them with 1,500 keys in reserve and with the 18 gram a day times everybody, uh, that's 15,000 keys monthly demand. So, if Conroy had not had his case, they would have come up to April 1st, MMAR gone, people can't grow, MMPR in, no supply. And first motion that asked for declares MMA PR didn't work, therefore the Beano, bad exemption, no offense. So that is what we could have had. They were saved by the extension. Health Canada would. And that gives them time now to get more LPs online before they issue another close down order and shut down people. But here's the point. A quarter of the growers were bluffed into sh shutting down and they were left out of John Conroy's relief thousands and their only way to get their grows back while it takes a year or two for Conroy's case to go through the courts is to use my two dollar kits and ask a judge for a personal exemption now why would the government have appealed the Allard decision letting sick people keep growing because there's no supply and they can't afford it anyway do they really think some judge is going to take that away so, if they know they ain't going to win, why are they wasting time before shutting them down and winning? And Why? Because they're not ready yet, and they want more time. So we now got to wait for an appeal, and maybe to the Supreme Court, over whether these sick people should have been allowed to continue growing <laughs> until something worked. And then come back and start over. So... That's why they're not ready. Now, that opens an interesting possibility. I thought, wow, what if John Conroy, who if he'd just not even started, they would have been dead, not saved. What if John Conroy abandons their statement of claim? Now the 150 gram limit's gone. Now the whole Manson decision, which is an interlocutory order, is gone. And now Health Canada are faced with us in federal court within days saying, you got no supply. And 19 other big issues. So, if only Conroy would withdraw that class act. Oh, oh, jeez, oh. it's not Conroy's decision. It's the decision of Neil Allard, Tanya Beamish, uh, Sean Davey, and uh, I think David Hebert, the four people whose names are on a statement of claim. Those four people hold in their hands the protection of the MMAR won by John Conroy. And if those people, the Allied Four, can be induced to pick up a Termel Gatling gun and get ready to throw away their Conroy pea shooters and file a motion to show up in federal court with us on March the 22nd, and right as they go in, they abandon the protection of Health Canada's MMPR, and now they're faced with no supply and all the other shots at them. I think that could be the end of prohibition. Now, I've been joking on the internet that Health Canada must be shitting their pants to think that their fate of their regime is sitting in the hands of four probably legitimately sick people.
so think about that. We're going in anyway, with 20 guns against the MMPR blazing, even if the MMAR is dead. But wouldn't it be neat if the Allard Four were there to sap their defenses just before we trigger off our artillery? And those four people have the power to abandon the protection that John Conroy won for Health Canada's regimes. And Bino, bad exemption, no offense. Because remember, Court of Appeal and JP said uh, a prohibition needs absent a constitutionally valid medical exemption, there's no prohibition. And of course, present a constitutionally valid medical prohibition prohibition is present. So, no MMAR, no CDSA. They dropped 4,000 charges the last two pe year period. They're going to have to drop all the rest now. So, that is basically where we are. Any of the left outs, anybody who wants an exemption never could get one. They got medical files, but could never find a recalcitrant, unprofessional, bum doctor who wouldn't do his research. You can apply. And ask a judge, I need my exemption so I can grow for my own use, please. And I can't imagine too many people with legitimate medical reasons not scoring that personal exemption. Over the next couple of years, Health Canada dances with John Conroy over his cosmetic fixes. Okay? So, get your statements of claim filed and submitted. And uh, there's a simple motion. It's the SC file and the N4 file and the letter to the administrator. And let's see if we can get something set for March the 22nd where the major guns go in and everybody else gets to listen and watch and see what happens. Okay? Johnny Engineer, the MedPot Combat Engineer, signing off.